Hello, a warm welcome to readers, everyone, who, is, who are joining us today. I'm Christine Dearness from Willoughby City Library and your host for this webinar conversation with our distinguished guest author, whom I'll introduce shortly. I begin by acknowledging the Camaragal of the Eora Nation, the traditional, traditional custodians of Willoughby land and of all the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia. We pay our respect to the elders past, present, and yet to be made by their communities who continue to strengthen cultural heritage, knowledge, and wisdom of community and land. And so with the goal of sharing knowledge, culture, and story, I have the pleasure of welcoming our guest, Tom Keneally, it's an honour to have your company today. Thank you, Christine. Now, Tom Keneally needs no introduction, but I'm going to give you one anyway. Author Tom Keneally has written a great many works of fiction, history and biography, as well as poetry and, I'm told, raps, including two winners of the Miles Franklin Award, Bring Larks and Heroes, and Three Cheers for the Paraclete, three novels shortlisted for the Booker, The Chant of Jimmy Blacksmith, Gossip from the Forest and Confederates, and of course, the prize-winning Booker, Schindler's Ark. His nonfiction includes his grand multi-volume history of the Australian people, simply called Australians. Tom is not just known for being a writer, but as an advocate for an Australian Republic, for refugees and asylum seekers, and for writers. And for all that and more, he's officially an Australian national living treasure, whose image adores an Australian stamp. Tom, Kene Tom Keneally joins us from his home in Manly. Welcome, Tom. Thank you. Uh, it, it's, uh, you know, people who go to libraries, people who, who read, they keep this whole industry going. And it employs, it employs about 20,000 people all up, warehousemen, salespeople, book designers, printers. So my undisguised thanks to all of you as well. Well, you're definitely an advocate for libraries as well, for public libraries. And also you've, um, you've bequeathed a library, haven't you, in Sydney? The yes, I've got a, a library okay. in town. And I used to be there every Tuesday and people would come in. But COVID's put an end to all that. When COVID is over uh, and we're over elbow yeah. bumping, Please come in, 280 Pitt Street, third floor. It's the curiously named Mechanic School of Arts Library, uh, which is on the second floor, and uh, the Tom Keneally Centre is on the third. And we're specialised in welcoming people who have a manuscript in their back pocket. Not always with success, because it's hard to get published now in a different way from when we when when I began, but uh, welcome there when COVID is over, when we meet that uh, fabulous eighty <laughs> percent. And I also believe you're internationally recognised. Well, in New York, you have been honoured as being a literary lion of the New York Library. Yes, the New York Library is a wonderful place. And I have done some research there on, on books that were published in, in America. Uh, research, interestingly, on Irish convicts, and you hear, might hear more about that, who escaped to the US and became notable figures. Uh, the, there are two big lines set out the front of the stone line. Are you? <laughs> uh, set out the front of the uh, New York Public Library. And if they want to give you an award, they make you a lion. 
and they have a banquet in the whole library, including oh. the, the the libraries that are normally uh, specialized, research libraries. And um, um, we don't allow any drinking or eating in our library, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> but, so you Tom, can make you've... people uh, <laughs> lines of the Hornsby Library or, or lines of the... Or, or wombats would be the... Or, yeah, maybe a possum or something like that. Um, now, Tom, you've always set a cracking pace with your writing and your publishing, and this year you've produced a new novel, Captain Hitler's Pistol. I've got a copy yes. here, and it's hugely enjoyable. First question, Tom, and please, no spoilers. What has Hitler's pistol got to do with Kempsey, the main street, which is which adorns the cover of your book? Yes, and uh, a very familiar street. Uh, my aunt's dress shop that the main character goes to, the Quinlan sister's dress shop, was off to the left, uh, sorry, to the right of that woman. And to the left of that woman, you went across the bridge and you came to my grandfather's uh, Harp of Erin store, uh, which appears in the book as well. Uh, now, a number of Kempsey issues came together for me in this book. Uh, when settlers took over the, um, the, the Maclay Valley, there was a very uh, noble-bodied, um, people called the Thungudi people already occupying it quite thickly because it is lush, it is abundant, um, the uh, uh, fish leaping out of the water into the creel, uh, and the white town um, had relationships of the two black settlements at that stage by the side of the town, Burnt Bridge and Green Hill, which is still there. Uh, Green Hill, that is, but the locals call it Green Hill. And, um, the, uh, in, um, your, in the dedication in your book, which is to your parents, Elsie and Tom, you say some of the stories um, in this book are theirs, the rest are the author's fault. Yes, so, indeed. <laughs> so that so Kempsey can beat me up. My mother worked at Barsby's, which is a shop just where that bus on the cover is. And she oh, sometimes oh, sold. There. Yes. And be just about there. Uh, it, was, it was the David Jones of Kempsey. So uh, to the Kempseyites, it was bigger than David Jones. And she used to sell cosmetics to the one of the main characters in the book, to Chicken Paul, who is a gay cinema pianist. And why he bought cosmetics was that he was a makeup artist, Monkey, and he used to make up uh, Aboriginal women who'd come to him. They wouldn't go to... If there were makeup artists in Kempsey, they wouldn't go to the, the, the normal, they'd be banished from the normal beauty shop, shops, but they weren't banished by um, Chicken because he wanted to be a makeup artist. He was also called Chicken because he used to hypnotize Chicken. My father, uh, he taught my father how to hypnotize chickens and other animals. And he had to be able to hypnotize Chicken's because his father was a sleeper cutter, the sleepers on the railway, which used to be timber. And uh, he could hypnotize them so that they never woke again. They were on the dinner table before they woke. Uh, and then my mother told me the stories about the makeup. And my father told me the stories about being an assistant projectionist at the Victoria cinema for a time and uh, so chicken was sort of a family myth 
He used to come to my aunt's tech shop to check out on the latest fashions from Sydney. So he was trying to find out what they were wearing in Paris and Los Angeles by the filter of Sydney and by the filter of what we can sell in Kempsey. Uh, and in the novel does all these things. Even in the novel is a gay man. And I wanted to write a sort of homage or mourning for gay men, given the way we ordinary blacks were all raised. Our prejudice was just inbred in us. We'd never met a gay man that we knew about. And then as an older man, when I moved to Manly, I was very shocked when the story came out about a young gay man who was chucked off the cliff about 300 meters from here, a beautiful cliff called uh, Bluefish. And Bluefish fish, uh, cliff is right above the, orth, uh, uh, the Pacific. It should be a place of unalloyed joy, but it, it has been for this area an execution ground in the past a young gay man. And so I wanted to put some of that in this book too by treating, having begun in life looking upon the gay man as the committer of the sin that you could never be forgiven for, never get to heaven, as well as being sus in the social sense as well. I wanted to um, have a character. So he's this cinema pianist who actually existed and for whom my father was assistant uh, pianist, the Quinlans. But there are a few other strands, aren't there? Uh, Christine, if I'm brief, can I go? So, yes, in this um, story, which is set between the wars, 1933 predominantly, Depression era, uh, you don't have to look far beneath the surface to see the um, rifts and divisions within the, this community that you've described. Um, so you've already um, told us about one of the discrimination or two, the, the um, white Australians and the Aboriginal people and also the um, the homosexual man in the town who wasn't, um, who, who, there was that um, rift. Um, what were some of the other fault lines which would have divided this, which you've described has divided this community? Well, the Thunguddy lived north and south of town and sadly, white men uh, sometimes uh, used those settlements for um, sexual relief. And they often bullied uh, the black women in various ways, threat of uh, involvement of police, uh, th uh, but also the use of shonky liquor. Uh, even in the 70s, someone up there who used to give the Aboriginal community before the curfews were fully over, used to give the Aboriginal community uh, rose-hip spirit and methylated spirits. See, Aboriginals couldn't go to um, the pubs. And uh, so uh, many of them in, in the situation of Indigenous people all over the world saw the same thing in Colorado with the youth settlement. All over the world, some, some indigenous people develop uh, an incredible dependence on our hooch. And they only got the worst stuff, the stuff that was going to drive them mad. And, uh, and yet there was such a desperate dependence. And those men were willing to have their wives used for uh, for, for, uh, for any debate because they were uh, 
uh, in that mental illness of extreme alcoholism. And so uh, there, there had to be, I began to think, women who went to town on Friday afternoon, everyone went to town. We, all went to town. We, we only didn't go to town if, that, if Uncle Joe Bully couldn't get his, uh, you know how you used to crank cars in the early 30s? If he couldn't get his car cranked up, and, but he would go to huge limits and he'd always get it going. And we would all go down in his Ford and there'd be everyone there. And the best people in town were dressed. They could have gone to government, government house. But they were dressed that way. Uh, and yes, so uh, apart from your descriptions of the more um, uncomfortable and harrowing divisions, um, the um, Victoria Cinema actually is uh, uh, an example of um, the way you describe very amusingly the hierarchy of power and privilege um, and the seating arrangement there. Would you like to tell us something about the seating arrangement of the residents on a Saturday night when they go and watch one of these silent movies with Chicken playing the piano. And the Quinlan boys on the projector and they yes. had to stop to change the reels. When whistling would break out, the lovers in the back seats would unclinch. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and, and so who so, was... Uh, the yes, the Aboriginals were only allowed to sit in certain seats. And they would walk a long way to go to the cinema, all the way in from um, from Burntbridge and, and Greenhill. It's quite a schlep, particularly going back. Uh, there's a hill you've got to rise up to get to Greenhill. So uh, the um, Aboriginals were in the front rows. On the nights they weren't required to be curfew, you know. I don't know how they arranged to come to the cinema, but they, they did. They also couldn't uh, dance on a, uh, they couldn't swim in the local pool. And uh, my aunts tell me that the, even the dancers in these country towns, we think of Australia as very, Australia is very egalitarian. But there was an enclosed area right in the middle and you could only dance there if you were the town aristocracy and then a, a rope around the outside where the yobos and, and the irish catholics and the german dairy farmers could dance <laughs> Oh, and, and you're reminding me of one of my favorite vignettes in the book where um I think the little Catholic boy genuflecting in the aisle, getting mixed up about whether he was at church or at the pictures. <laughs> yes, and he gives himself away at once as one of the underclass, the tykes, you know. And but, that happened um, a lot. That happened a lot when I was a kid. And we'd laugh like blazers. We'd join in the we'd join in laughter with the products. <laughs> And um, you also talk about the train driver, Breslin. Um, and Breslin's I've got a based on my grandfather, yeah. Oh, on your grandfather, who, yes. well, is this a true uh, occurrence? He remained on his rebellious ass for God save the king. Absolutely. <laughs> my grandfather used to embarrass us by never getting up for God save the king. Uh, and... He was a good union man, and for years he drove the train between Harry and Grafton and back, and he was based oh. in Tennessee. And Brez, my grandfather told me about all the travelling men in town, and once he had a man killed on top of one of his carriages. He didn't even know he was there. But the union men used to slow down for the unemployed near town because men had to go from town to town to get their doll. So they had a conspiracy with the unemployed, the traveling men, 
that they slow down in a particular area, just inch along, and if you were traveling to Kempsey, you could get off. And if you were wanting to go to Grafton, you could get on the rattlers under the carriages. And occasionally, in all this unofficial travel, uh, a man would be killed. And this man was killed sitting on top of a carriage. And the my, my grandfather was stricken with guilt, but it wasn't his fault. And he, they went through and got a free Sydney to Kempsey ticket, sent it to his widow, um, got her to come up on the train. They buried, it's like the union buries its dead. They buried this unemployed man whose head was crushed. They got a, uh, an undertaker they know to do a bit of work on the skull and he was buried in a suit and his wife saw him before he was buried. Uh, and uh, because they brought her up from Kempsey. And that's a great story, and it's in there. But again, it was a great thing, let alone the, um, the, 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 the Irish Catholics and the Italian Catholics and so on. They were a subclass too in the town in those days. They weren't going to be in that centre ring dancing. Uh, and uh, therefore, uh, the the uh, uh, that that still existed, and the Irish Civil War was still going on between the rebels, the IRA, and the uh, and the Free State. So that was still going on. There were still men with blood on their mind, very much so. They intended to commit murder. If the bloke had immigrated here, they intended to kill someone when they went back. And we know that because duties, well, duties found. My wife has a wonderful family that has an Australian side, and the same convict has descendants in Ireland in a village called Lawrencetown. And you, they know each other, and they told us about all the bloodletting went on after the Civil War. And uh, Sebastian Barry, who's a great writer, you'd have in both your libraries here in the number of libraries, he had an uncle shot by the IRA in an art gallery in Cincinnati. So they pursued men. And then I met over in Mayo a group of men who said, oh, my father, you know, Enfield. Well, Enfield is a, an old suburb of Sydney. He said, my father worked there in a rebel gang crew. We had people inside the New South Wales uh, <laughs> Railway. And they did a job for a gang of rebels. And they did. And he, he talked about, he said that the um, uh, Australian women were very handsome, but... Um, you know, there wasn't a lot of time for the Civil War because the <laughs> Irish and uh, uh, the Irish rebels and the Irish Free State did dreadful things to each other. And so, so um, Tom, in your in this book here, one of the characters, a dairyman, Johnny Costigan, he um, is tormented by his time as an IRA volunteer and his capture and torture by the National Army. Uh, um, you describe a truly harrowing, his truly harrowing experience. Um, so this that you've been telling us, your family, your wife's family story and and all of, also um, Sebastian Barry's family story, um, um, the, these incidents, inspired this character and his narrative thread yes. through this story? And, and also the funny place where stories come from. Uh, I went to Prague a few years ago to get a prize before COVID, and it was the flashest event, flasher than the Booker Prize. It was wonderful. They gave the prize with the Prague Symphony on the 
they, they gave a, a number of national prizes, about half a dozen, to, a, you know, some for music, some for film, and one for literature. And I got the literature and it was in the Spanish room of the old castle in Prague. Everyone wore dinner suits. Everyone was dressed up like a doctor's clerk, as my father would have said. And we, uh, but the Irish ambassador in Prague contacted me and said, can you come to lunch? Because my mother's a Keneally and I can fi fill you in on what happened to us during the Civil War. So I went to his place for lunch, delightful in Blackpool Sheehan, but his mother was a Keneally. And he filled me in on all the Keneallys from Newmarket Park who were on either side. And uh -huh. one who was on the rebel side didn't get out of prison till 1935. So that's why there were folks fleeing here and to America and carrying grudges. And I write about that in the same context with Mr. Costigan. And then last of all, most importantly, where did his first pistol come in? And we can maybe have questions after I explain this. And Hitler's pistol came in because on the night of 19th of July, 1916, a very vain Australian general called Mackay wanted his division to be the first to take on the Germans in France. The first uh, uh, meeting of arms with the Germans. Rommel was a diversion action from the song. And in it, a lot of innocent boys were killed overnight. Thousands were killed overnight. The Australians were sent to capture the German trenches. Okay, now, the 53rd Battalion was exactly in the line that their job was to capture the lines of the 16th Reserve Bavarian Regiment. That was the regiment in which and a runner. So boys from the Maclay were attacking a regiment in which Hitler was a corporal runner. Now, and this was boys, trench warfare, hand-to-hand -hand trench warfare. Uh, dreadful. And and when they get the, to the German lines, they find the German lines are so much better because the Germans hadn't had to move out of their lines much. They just attacked the stupid the, the, the lambs that the stupid British sent. And same men like Mackay because to get the Brits their credit, they were debating whether to call it off. And they were heavily in favour of calling it off. We're going to go. And uh, thousands of boys died for that. It's astounding. Anyhow, uh, uh, and one of them keeps Hitler prisoner, one who captures the lines, keeps an ordinary Claude Hopper German prisoner overnight. What happened in reality, and the war history, the official war history says this, is that all these well-made bunkers in the German lines, the Germans crept back to them and took the Australians prisoner because the Australians had had no backup. And they became prisoners. But a number of German soldiers who had got to know the Australian overnight and were grateful in many cases for not having been shot out of hand. A number of them just showed the way back to the sap. And that morning, there was a terrible fog all over the front line. And so these men didn't have, an, have to ask an officer's permission. They could say, we'll take you. In, in a few cases, they took them into no man's land to the sap that led to the Australian line. And, uh, so it's obvious that your research and the discoveries that inevitable co inevitably come, 
they thrill you still. Yes, and, and um, so a boy from Kempsey could have yeah. taken Hitler's. Yeah, and the character in your book, um, um, the 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 owner of farms and upstanding um, and citizen, a German immigrant, son of a German immigrant, so son of a German. Yeah, he, uh, he gets Bert to know. Weber. He he gets um, to know a Lu a remarkable Lutheran pastor named Lemke in this book. And he is a soldier too. There aren't enough spots for pastors. So he were a number of um, ministers of religion were killed as common soldiers, as in the and Lemke, who whose father is a Lutheran minister and he's the Lutheran minister in an area of New South Wales that has more Lutherans. Up in Kempsey, mainly Bavarian Catholics. And the irony is that the Bavarian Catholics married with the Irish. Because, and so uh, you have many a good Irish girl who inherited a good German name. Uh, the men beside my uh, grandfather's shop, a butcher's shop called Knorr, or Kanauer, uh in German. And the Canors are known people in Kempsey and are more Australian than you can get. They were an example uh, of how many Germanic people there were up there. And so altogether, the former history, and that Albury, uh, Albrook was called Germantown until World War I. It was full of Germans too. And the Lutheran ministers gave the service in German, which made them very Well, just um, another example of how the great episodes of European history are really not that far as removed as we think from Australia. No, I and love how, it how uh, every and, American yes. says to me, I did a bloke like you, I'm saying you're very like you, right, simple as that. And I say, but when I was in Homebush, our new suburb we moved to with our infallible nose for glamorous spots, when we were in Homebush, my father used to send back, about every month, he sent back an Australian comfort fund fake tin, all sealed up with uh, sticking plaster, of the kind used for wounds, all sealed up in plaster, he'd send back a cake tin full of German or Italian uh, memorabilia. So, um, Tom, did he ever send anything back that was kind of German, like um, a, a not a, a but not a Luger? Uh, no, but he sent back a Luger holster. Oh, and obviously he wouldn't have sent back the Luger because he didn't want me messing around with the pistol. And perhaps there was a, you know, there's always a shot left in the barrel often. And he could have taken that out, but he could have also made a mistake. So he didn't send the Luger, he sent the Luger holster. And so I was Tom, close and... I'm having a look at the Q and A's now, and there's a lot of interest, and some of them are, are, are very um, encouraging or endorsing comments that I'll pass on to you later. Um, and some of them I think you've already answered, such as why the title, uh, but um, or maybe, and um, and from that's from. Tracy and Susan Wyndham says, I think you own a Luger pistol holder that your father sent home during World War II. And that's, that's just right. what you it's were in talking my about. And um dear, uh, dear Susan. And was on. that was was that the trigger that inspired this novel? Yes. She asked? And, uh, it combined with the story I was told it was a sort of self protective myth. My cousins were still Red-headed Keneally's from the Harper Veron, Danny Keneally's uh, sons were 
still in Kempsey because he was vice master of West Kempsey. And they introduced me to some boys who said, uh, the Brosnan boys and so on. I think it was one of the Brosnan boys from the railway hotel who told me that there was an old, cranky old uh, uh, dairy farmer out on the flats beyond beyond the Kempsey Swamp on the way to Southwest Rocks. And he, uh, I just forget what that area is called. And he is it Smith Town? A hit, he, on the way to Southwest Rock. There's a flat yeah. area that gets flooded and it's a great dairy farming country. Is it anywhere near Smithstown? I think that's where it, the... Yeah, it's on the way to Smithstown. And Fred, right. Yeah. And, uh, well, we've got a number of people joining us, I can see from the Q&A from that area, and uh, they would they would be putting their hands up now, hands shouting up, at sorry, their friends, this is telling you, <laughs> trying to remind you of that area's name. And these boys told me that he was an old digger, and he had taken a um, pistol off Hitler and still had it, but you couldn't go and ask him because he'd shoot anyone who came on it. So you couldn't ask him, which made the myth impact <laughs> into itself. But it's a possibility because the 53rd Australian Battalion was exactly opposite. When I looked that up and thought, I thought that's got to go into the boys from the North Coast, exactly opposite that Bavarian regiment in which Hitler served. He was actually an Austrian by birth. But he, he liked the variants. Uh, and uh, so, first of all, he was, n he was not a world war criminal at this stage. He was very anti Semitic. The beginnings were there. Uh, and uh, he, he was quite a brave fellow at this stage, you know. And so um, he, he believed that the war should have gone on. And. Uh, his pistol lies dormant in a Kempsey house until he becomes chancellor. And suddenly it's up and it's going to do murder. And it does murder in the form that's in the book. Well, um, that was actually one of our Q&A um, questions. Um, according to the principal, Tom, of Chekhov's gun, if you have a firearm in your title, then by the last act, it must fire. Yes. Now, without giving any spoilers, how far were you into your plotting before you knew who would fire the pistol and at whom? I knew who the who would be blamed for it. Because if you're the favourite homosexual, you're the only fa only the favourite homosexual until uh, something outrageous happens. And as well as that, the pistol had been, by circumstance, a brief time in Chickham's house in Clyde Street. And thus, uh, it, it was taken by another party, but Chickham's going to pay for it. Uh, and uh, the uh, when the murder occurs. Uh, so I did know that I wanted, you know, where I wanted the killer to come from, out of the betrayal that Hoskinson was guilty of in um, Ireland. And it's a cruel, mm -hmm. the way he gives up his friends it's a cruel event. It's the cruelest event you could imagine. But the Irish in that civil war did things to each other that in mythology we only attribute to the British. But in fact, it, it was the, you know, wars are dreadful things. And war crimes are always close to being, close to occurring. And even the light horse that destroyed the Ottoman Empire. They were guilty of at least one war crime. 
that I, I can tell you about, but we don't have time. And, uh, you know, well, all... Tom, actually, one of our um, Q&A um, contributions um, from Kerry is, she says that, that she's very interested in your historical no um, knowledge of your family and other um, contributions from other um, of the Q&A participants like Di are saying that they're very interested in the local history stories of, of around Kempsey. And they're wondering if you've actually documented these anywhere um, as an oral history perhaps or um, in articles or memoir. I wrote um, in 2000, it was published in Granta, a study of my parents' town, which was Kempsey. And they were alive, of course, they were very young when World War I ended. I had an uncle in World War I, and he was the oldest from the half of Aaron store, and my father was the youngest. Uh, and I wrote a mem memoir, and they told me, I, I kept on leaving a recorder at my father's place, but that was too, too sort of posh for him to do, to record his memoirs. So he kept on saying, why would he be interested in, in what Wolf had like myself had to say? So one day I said, uh, I need the money I'm going to do this piece for Granta. Would you help me out by letting yourselves be interviewed? And I just ran the tape. And it was in that interview that I found that my mother used to sell cosmetics. And, and I oh. thought, wow. My father, was, my father knew him, and he used to come to my auntie's store. And so, and I remember him coming. Uh, and because he lived on, and he has a... You can make a book out of the second half of his career. Um, and um, these, when I, when I knew that he used to make up Aboriginal women, I thought that's too good to be ever waiting. You hear stories that are too good. I then heard this story and I thought I'll check it up in the official history and in divisional history. The div and the regimental histories, all the, I mean, it's wonderful how everything's online, the whole official war history, but also you can bring up regimental memoirs. And the the sad thing was the, the, the German lines had been subjected to such a horrifying bombardment that a number of officers told even the 53rd Battalion boys that you won't find anyone. They've all been wiped out. And in fact, hundreds of the 53rd uh, Regiment were, were killed assaulting those lines because of the wonderful infrastructure that the, the bomb-proof shelters and so on. Germans have been in their own mind. And uh, so uh, I researched and found out the 53rd Battalion from the North Coast had been there. And I thought, wow, it is possible. Given the history, given what happened that night, it is plausible that a McClay boy got a pistol. I then didn't set out to prove it. I then set out to write a novel. <laughs> but you could read the 53rd Battalion, uh, what was written each day under fire by the battalion historian who was often the the, the major the adjutant uh, and it's all yeah you know, some of it's in pencil and it's all in microfilm in the, on the war memorial so that I, i've got to say this material is a gold mine then there are individual men who died during the 30s and who left their diaries to the state government. And you got, if you want to research a the personal experience of a 
of say a um, stretcher bear. Uh, he there'll be journals about it in the state library. So that's what that's the research I did. I, I didn't research so, whether it was true or not because fiction means lies. Well, Tom, so, um, I've heard you say at a previous author talk that when it comes to history you're a cheap drunk yeah. um, so, and, and Louise is asking was the research more fun than the actual writing or do you find both enjoyable I find both give me something which is irreplaceable and transcendent because stories come from that part of you. This is a story that's often happened in history before, where the wanderer, Ulysses, from a far place, takes back all this baggage, all these war mementos with him. And uh, we write out of the collective unconscious, the collective unconscious in which there's every story every mythology, every stereotype, every archetype supplies us with our books as we go along. They, these stereotypes in my novel just happen to come from the Mackay Valley, but they're eternal. Everything that happened in Greek myth happens in every town in Australia, in every village in Australia. And uh, the... Um, Therefore, the people wear an Australian visage and talk in Australian idiom of that time. As an example of that, I wanted to call it the box of the clerk. But my publisher proved to me that Australians don't say that anymore. When I was a young bloke, if you were well-dressed, they'd say, oh, some Sheila's lucky because you're dressed up like a box office <laughs> And the box office came into Australian usage uh, in the, early in the second half of the 19th century. And it was used universally where, wherever I lived and by Australian men. And it's now gone out of usage. It means you dressed up like Someone who's come to town to sell the sell the joint. <laughs> so um, you're quite happy to um, you're quite comfortable to, about being called a writer of historical fiction. It seems because um, you believe that as well as being set in um, the specific, um, it also. Um, speaks to the communal unconscious and the communal experience yes, of being human and, and, uh, and all the relationships that involve. Yeah. I, I'll tell you, I, I've got such a sophisticated publisher now. It, it's in America, Simon and Schuster. They're about to publish The Dickens Boy, my last novel, about Charles Dickens' son in Australia. And they never argue with weird Australian phraseology if an American make, can make it out from the context. So I've got someone in the book talking about shy acting, which probably only my generation understands, mucking about playing silly buggers, the younger generation might call it, or the middle-aged generation. Uh, and... Um, They've let me use shy acting in, let it be published with shy acting in fact, because they can tell from the text what it means. And then tell it, uh, a, a reader can tell from the text what it means. This means they've either given up on selling my books or they've become more enlightened or a mixture of both. <laughs> and uh, that uh, Australian idiom is... is somehow precious when you put it in a book and when you know that the modern reader who has the most nifty up-to-date 
I got uh, can tell what it is from the context. Um, I remember an uh, Australian, an American publisher, let me use Walloper in because you could tell what it was. <laughs> All these wonderful phrases we have. Well, um, also wonderful place names because we do have some suggestions from um, some people up in the Kempsey area when you were searching for the uh, name of the area between Kempsey and Southwest Rocks. And, um, yes. And one of the respondents said perhaps you're thinking of Hampden Hill or Austral Eden. Yes, it's and, just near Austral Eden. Eden. And there was another, which I hope I haven't lost, but it was the most delicious long name with Billy Papa or something in it. I think now, I've lost it. A wonderful Aboriginal the name. Name. Uh, Dong Ding Along uh, is a wonderful name. Yarra Happeny. Columbati. Kempsey's got the the the, the uh, hinterland of Kempsey as the most bonza name. But it, 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 it's just the side of Austral Eden, which has a great it, it's where there's a German associated with surveying up there, I think, and his name was Verge. And there's an oh. area called the Verge Estate. And he had two oh. sons. One was called one was called Austral. Yes. And I think uh, and Austral Eden is named after his son because it was Austral's Eden. It's flood plant brain too. But it is right right this side, something flat. So, well, Corrine is suggesting Bellimpopini. Bellimpopini. Oh, no. Didn't I tell you they have the best names? Just <laughs> <near Bellimpopini. laughs> now, Tom, um, we need to head into our clothes soon. All those um, um, we, we've got uh, a couple of people here who uh, have got some lovely messages come in to chat to you, some of your relatives too. And um, I um, am told to say hello to you from your cousin, Jan Guest. But oh, there's some yes. beautiful and, messages. Yeah. Her, um, mother, and, her mother's wedding had to be postponed because of oh. the in, the McLean, in 1947. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say because of coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> the McClay River um, notorious floods. Well, speaking of COVID, uh, there is a question here. How are you going, Tom, with all this social distancing? Are you working on a new, another new book? Is it a novel? Maybe a, a um, sequel to... Um, Cap Corporal Hitler's pistol, or um, or are you just enjoying some downtime? Uh, no, I, I, I'm a bookaholic. I can't do without <laughs> the book. And uh, what a lucky old sod to be 85 and still able to publish, uh, because the publishing industry is is very tough at the moment uh though there's just a young man from Kempsey who's published a book yeah my um uh next book actually is uh there are two books because it's about 800 pages i think it'll be published in two i'm writing a book called a last good rant you know how if you're young, old blacks take you apart and rant to you about politics. Well, this is my political rant. I'm a great despiser of the politics that says government should be small and it shouldn't, uh, it should leave 
uh, business, anything that is business, including running the welfare system to the private, to the uh, to, to do business, business gazumps government. Now we'll see what happens. The big owned by foreigners. Um, we've seen what happened when a government is so impotent it can't manage its own COVID vaccine distribution because it has so privatised everything, airline, bank, everything that can be privatised. If our, if our ear holes could be privatised and they could sell shares in them, they would. And the doctrine that business is supreme and that government shouldn't interfere with red tape um, it is supreme at the moment. But COVID has challenged. My book's about that. It's about writing. Uh, I've got a comforting chapter, which is called Any Mug Can Write a Novel. And I know that from personal experience. And I've got a book on, uh, a thing on death and a, it's full of everything I'm obsessed with, uh, this last good rant. And it's coming out. I wrote it under COVID. I finished the second half of the Dickens boy under COVID. I had to have a cancer uh, operation. And I was so, I knew it was good enough to be published. It was a dead man's book. I passed out in the operation has happened to a minority of people. But I survived and I was able to revise it. And I, I really love that book, The Dick Boy, which took a long time for me to come to, to write. You need a good time for elements of your own family history allied with elements of history. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, my my remote cousin in Prague telling me about what happened in Newmarket, Cork, our village in North Cork during the Civil War. That enriched this story too. Uh, and um, so ultimately all the elements come and you have enough uh, information. And so I wrote, I read a number of histories of the Civil War, which followed the Troubles. And uh, all that, when you're reading that, you think, this is fantastic. This is going to be easy. Right. And let me tell you, in every book, there's a romance. There's an infatuation with the material that keeps you going to about the middle of the romance. The way infatuation keep you going to the middle of the marriage. And then you, there's a certain doubt kicks in. Is this the woman or the man for me? Is this the book for me? And have I got enough material? And who am I to write it? I'm talking about things that happened when I wasn't there that I've only heard stories about. And you get this depression, and it's normally then that the first writer has their mental, um, and then they go on to other jobs, has their mental breakdown, you know. And it's when the writer generally resorts to liquor or to what you should resort to is just a little bit of writing each day and excursions. They're the answer. When you, when you get stuck, you go on writing even though you know it's bad. You're sort of writing to yourself, putting in the bad options. You ought to do at least 300 words of that a day. You write a letter saying, I don't know where in the bugger I'm going, but I, I could do this, but I then could do that. And you write a letter. And sometimes the, 
the resolution to your novel is in that material. So when you lose face, say, don't worry, it'll be back in about a week. And um, <laughs> if you've taken enough time for your unconscious brain to catch up to what your conscious brain wants. It's your unconscious brain that provides, you think you start the novel, and there's Chopper, uh, not Chopper, uh, uh, there is, uh, um, uh, Chicken making up Aboriginal women, and that's in the first draft. But what happens in 1933 if a woman from the town aristocracy, one of the wealthiest men in town, the man who builds everyone's building, goes to Chicken, the makeup artist, and insists she makes him up. And then present that made up face. She's not a woman that usually takes a lot of trouble with. She uses makeup, but not fanatically. And she presents Chicken's makeup face to her husband. Those connections where she has been made up in her desperation are for reasons that. And chicken lives a short way from the from, from the lawyer she goes to, who gives her a little hope. And so she goes, there is an encounter between the top end of town and the bottom end of town. You think of options like that as the novel goes on. It takes time now during the writing of. And so you get organic connections. She even goes to know Mr. Breslin. She even talks to Breslin. He's a Catholic engine driver, not her normal conversations. And uh, you get connections between characters that don't happen when you first think of their stories. And many of those come to you as a eureka moment. That is, it um, they come from your unconscious. Over time, by writing about this, um, the truth is that as Graham Greene said, and he's the top of the business, he, he's a great novelist. He says, you sit down to write the next chapter without knowing what connections are going to take part between the major parts of the novel. You've got no reason for these two stories to be in the book. You start writing and hating it, but you write 300, 400, 500 words, 1,000 words, 2,000 words. You're suddenly cooking with gas. And you're suddenly enjoying the process that's happened. But the connections that have provided you come to you as you write from your, uh, I, I say, it's, it's, it's my particular, from your collective unconscious, which I write about in my book. The collective unconscious is by any mug, any exiled person could write a book. And it will give you all the answers in the end if you are clever with it and just let it take its time. So uh, that's why I'm so fast. I've got a collective unconscious on the closer surface than other people have, than people who, respectable people, who have respectable dogs. <laughs> uh, you also, you have to have some crisis in your life to bring you to life. Well, Tom, you managed to weave your wisdom and your spirit and as well as your scholarship and your imagination into creating your books. You have many interested readers who are um, 
have tuned in today to listen to you speak about your newest book. Um, I have a message from Darren. So many wonderful messages, which I will send you all of them. Um, can't read them all out, but Darren says, Tom is not a national treasure. He is the national treasure. And um, so he can, Tom- He can try to persuade my wife of that. <laughs> So I think we'll we'll have to wrap up reluctantly the conversation today because people have joined us for their lunch hour, which has expired. And love to um, all the rallies, may I say. Oh, may well, I say, you, Sarah. You may, you may indeed. Thank you for this conversation. Thank you for that. And for another great book. Um with your imagining between the lines of history, interwoven with your own family's mem personal stories and your storytelling skills, uh, you bring the past very vividly into the present. And I want to say thank you, Tom, and I will um, let everyone who's participating know that the novel, Captain... Corporal Hitler's Pistol is available from loan from your library or um, will be soon, as soon as the library is open. Or you can purchase your own copy from your local independent bookshop, such as our local here in Willoughby, The Constant Reader. Great bookshop. Thank you, everyone, for joining the conversation. Stay safe and well. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Christine DNS. Goodbye. Thank you.